And now a reading from Luke chapter 20, verses 27 to 38. It's on page 84 of the Pew Bible. Some Sadducees, those who say there is no resurrection, came to him and asked him a question. Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies, leaving a wife but no children, the man shall marry the widow and raise up children for his brother. Now there were seven brothers, the first married and died childless. Then the second and the third married her. And so in the same way, all seven died childless. Finally, the woman also died. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will the woman be? For the seven had married her. Jesus said to them, those who belong to this age and age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are considered worthy of a place in that age and in the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. Indeed, they cannot die anymore because they are like angels and are children of God, being children of the resurrection. And the fact that the dead are raised, Moses himself showed in the story about the bush where he speaks of the Lord as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now he is God not of the dead, but of the living, for to him all of them are alive. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, may we remember that we stand in your holy presence. And so therefore, may the words of my mouth and all of our thoughts and reflections during this time of preaching and hearing be dedicated to your greater glory. In Jesus' name, amen. In the first church where I served as pastor, we conducted an all-church t-shirt sale. And all of the t-shirts were going to have the chalice, which is our logo, our church symbol. And then the text was going to read, First Christian Church, Disciples of Christ. But when we got all the t-shirts back, one batch was misprinted and so read First Christian Church, Disciples of Chris. Much to the consternation of most people except for one boy in the youth group fortuitously named Chris, who was a big fan and thought we all should wear his t-shirts. Well, typos like that in the church can provide no shortage of lightheartedness, especially in bulletins and newsletters. Certainly you've heard this one before, whether it's actually true or not. What makes it humorous is that it could easily be true. The newsletter article that read, The choir is looking for new members. If interested, join us on Wednesday at 7 and be ready to sin. No doubt this would have attracted both singers and non-singers to choir practice. Or sometimes we don't even need a typo for us to laugh about our faith. In that first community, again, where I served, there was a well-known family named Christ but spelled C-H-R-I-S-T. As a newcomer to the community, I didn't know the lay of the land. I didn't know this family, this family name. And so imagine my surprise when I opened up the paper one morning and found this headline, Christ wins employee of the month. <laughs> to which my response was, well, who's going to beat him, right? Bill and purchasing? (laughs) Well, I share these as a way of beginning the sermon because I'm teaching a Sunday school class currently. It's made up of youth youth who are considering baptism after the new year. And a couple of weeks ago, Christine Lyman Harm and I had all of the youth 
kind of evaluate our worship service. They had a worksheet and they were to follow along every element in the service and they were supposed to indicate which parts really connected with them, which parts didn't, which parts were confusing. And then we sat down together and we analyzed their responses and uh, one girl said she didn't like the sermon, didn't connect with her. I'm not offended by that. It's okay. <laughs> But I said, well, okay, fine. Tell me, though, more about where that's coming from. And she said, well, I wish that, I wish that you told more stories, which as a sidebar, that's a real powerful statement just on, on the power that stories have to convey truth for us. But, but then she wanted to say, and I also like it when we laugh. I like it when we laugh, and I wish we laughed more. Now that comment flies in the face of everything that I learned as a, as a preaching student at the University of Chicago. I took a preaching class from Hans Dieter Betz, who for the latter half of the 20th century and on to today is truly one of the world's foremost biblical scholars. And in the first lecture, he said this, and I quote, when you preach a sermon, never ever talk about sports and never tell a joke. Of course, he was German and Presbyterian, neither of which is known for stand-up routines. But it makes me wonder, in light of all that, that this young girl said and in, in my preaching professor, why not laugh? Why not laugh in the sanctuary? Why not laugh in the life of faith? And why do we as mainline Protestants associate proper worship as being quiet and calm and no disruptions. Maybe we come by it honestly. Our disciples founder, Alexander Campbell, granted he, at this point he was talking about charismatic worship in the sense of speaking in tongues and people falling out and slaying in the Spirit. But those are uncontrolled utterances in worship. In some ways, laughter is the same way. It's uncontrolled expressiveness in worship. But Alexander Campbell said about these kinds of expressions, he said they're animalistic and we should avoid them at all costs. And if you're keeping score at home, animalistic is worse than barbaric. Or at least if you're barbaric, you're still human. But animalistic is subhuman. So maybe we come by it honestly. It's part of our DNA that's been handed down to us. And all the way to the, at least the 1960s, <laughs> I'm holding in my hand here something called the Pastor's Manual. It was published in 1962. But it, it's, a, it's a manual to pastors about how to do, how to conduct right and proper worship. And here's what it says, for example, about how to conduct a baptism. As in the case of every, fun every function in worship, order should characterize it. The water in the baptistry should be warm. Now, how many of you were baptized if you were immersed in warm water? How many of you in cold? You should have had warm water. Okay? Find your pastor. The water should be warmed so that the candidate will experience no shock from cold upon entering the water. Such shocks give rise to nervousness and later often seriously interfere with the proper administration of the baptism and may cause laughter. When you baptize, lower the candidate gently, and it literally says this, very gently, into the water in such a way as to create the least commotion in the water. It doesn't say this, but I'm imagining, because that's the way Jesus was baptized. <laughs> but you see that that's the, the tradition handed on to us. Quiet. Don't ripple. Don't literally ruffle the waves in worship. Well, our scripture today is not about disruption. It's not about laughter. There's nothing really funny at all about our scripture reading from the Gospel of Luke. The Sadducees, some Jewish leaders, they think they're being funny. They think they're being funny. They're trying to trick and trap Jesus 
with a question about the resurrection, which they don't even believe in anyway. That's the second line of the Scripture reading. They don't believe in it. Hey, Jesus, if you're so smart, answer us this one. And then they, then they pull this old archaic law from Leviticus about death and remarriage. And they say a woman's been married seven times, seven, the seven brothers, seven family members have in turn married her. They've all died. Everyone's died. In the resurrection, whose wife will she be? Now, not that we believe in the resurrection, but if we did, whose wife would she be? Well, there's nothing funny about that, is there? We have trouble losing one loved one, burying one loved one. And here she is, she's buried seven. So this passage is not about laughter. It is about emotion. It is about heartache. We can imagine or only imagine the devastating feelings she must have had having to go to so many funerals. Last week we celebrated All Saints Day, All Saints Sunday right here in the sanctuary. And there was definitely emotion that filled our sanctuary. Sadness, tears, it was heavy. It was pervasive, we felt it. And today's scripture, in some ways, it starts out like it belongs in last week's sermon. It's, a, it's about death and sadness and loss. And it's good for us to show emotion in worship, the emotion of sadness. I mean, after all, Jesus himself wept at the tomb of Lazarus, his beloved friend who died. If we can't bring our emotion to Jesus, to whom can we bring it? But our theme today is not sadness. Our theme today is Easter. Easter is a day when sadness is gone. Today is all about Easter, and it's why our call to worship and our prayers and our songs are about Easter. To remind us that sadness is not the last emotion that the gospel story leaves us with. Yes, Jesus died, and yes, he was buried, and yes, that was sad. But the first time we meet the followers of Jesus, after he was buried, they were greeted with the good news of Easter Sunday, that he's not here anymore. He was here, but now he's not. He lives, and he's gone ahead of you to lead you forward. And so we thought that since this is the first time that we've gotten together, since last Sunday's All Saints Sunday, it would be a good idea to remember this truth that's heard so prominently at Easter but is so appropriate all year round. The truth that Jesus lives, that the dead are raised, that God is a God not of the dead but of the living, which is what Jesus emphasized here. And that truth is proclaimed loudest and boldest on Easter Sunday. Think about what a joyous day Easter is. It's, it's my favorite Sunday of the year. Not only is the sanctuary packed or is it as packed as it ever is throughout the year, but Easter a, is a good day. You, I mean, it's impossible to have a bad Easter Sunday. I mean, even in our families, even if the Easter egg hunt has to come inside because we've been hit with some monumentally strange snowstorm the week before, or even though it might be stressful bringing the families together on Easter, Easter is a naturally joyous, uplifting day. We smile more on Easter. We allow ourselves to laugh more on Easter. Grudges are gone, or at least grudges are held less severely on Easter. Wounds are forgotten on Easter. We don't fear tomorrow's uncertainty as much on Easter. And that's really the way it should be. Because the truth of Easter, when properly grasped, is that everything else that we face in our lives pales in comparison to this truth, that the dead are raised and that our God is a God of the living, which is what Jesus 
was trying to communicate to the Sadducees. And in some ways, he gets the last laugh in this regard. He says to the Sadducees, whose wife will she be in the resurrection? Is that what you want to know? Well, what does it matter? The dead are raised, for goodness sakes. The dead are raised. And to focus on the particularities of this earthly life and to assume that God's kingdom operates by the same principles as our earthly logic is to miss the glorious truth that the dead are raised. And our God is a God of the living. When I think about that, it's, I think that it's akin to our saying, you know, I'm really looking forward to meeting Dad in heaven, but I just can't, can't help but wonder, is he going to be wearing the red sweater or the blue sweater? To which Jesus says, sweater schmatter. <laughs> the dead are raised. And to, and, to, and to worry about these particularities is to miss the glorious fact that you and he are united again forever. And when the dead are raised, there's going to be laughter and joy that is anything but quiet. I can't imagine. I don't know about you when you think about re- being reunited with your loved ones. But I can't imagine seeing my dad again for the first time and our conversation going something like this. Dad, how are you? You look good. How's grandpa? Are you eating well? Resting well? No. There's going to be joy and there's going to be laughter and there's going to be hugs and there's going to be audible tears and crying and all kinds of exuberation. Now, this sermon is not a clarion call to charismatic worship. Let me say that again. This sermon is not a clarion call for charismatic worship, I would never say from the pastoral standpoint that we should be someone other than we are not. That we should be expressive in a way that is uncomfortable for us. But I do believe that laughter has a role to play in our spirituality. To laugh at ourselves. To laugh with one another. To laugh at the ways that God can bestow grace and mercy on people as odd and quirky and weird and foolish as we can sometimes be. But mostly laughter is a part of our spirituality and should be because laughter is a sign of joy. Laughter like joy just comes from us because we've tapped into it. It's uncontrolled by nature. We can't fake laughter, at least not for very long. True laughter appears because at the core of our being, we have discovered something joyful. And that's the gospel message of salvation, witnessed so vividly on Easter. And there's no reason why we should limit the joy of Easter to the first Sunday after the first full moon, after the vernal equinox, which is when we celebrate Easter. And that's why people like Martin Luther said that every Sunday is a mini Easter. Every Sunday is a little Easter. Because it's true. Every Sunday we gather here, the dead are raised, and our God is a God of the living. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, I thank you for this day and for bringing us a joyful message and a joyful word. Every time we we gather, may we... Remember that there is true joy in the truth that the dead are raised with you and that you are a God of the living. Amen.